Good evening. <clears throat> uh, can everybody hear? It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be celebrating the creation uh, of the Center for Business Ethics and Responsible Leadership. I, I have known uh, Thomas for some time. He's a force of nature, uh, but he is a force of nature only uh, in cooperation with the kind of leaders that have assembled in this room. And my hat is off to this enterprise. Uh, somebody once said, uh, I learned my ethics at my mother's knee, but she didn't tell me about highly leveraged derivatives. <laughs> uh, there is a lot to be done. Thomas uh, asked if uh, I might direct some of my remarks towards the topic of disruption. Um, I have <clears throat> done uh, some work in that area, but it gave me an opportunity to uh, clock my thoughts. Uh, some of what you're going to hear tonight, though, is, uh, uh, is in its early stages. The uh, important thing to know about uh, disruption, I think, is that it's, it's led by the market, and uh, it's been defined in some instances as primarily about creating an enhanced user experience with greater functionality uh, in a way that uh, disrupts uh, existing uh, market relationships. But what I want to focus on tonight is how it disrupts not only markets but also values. Now here are some examples of uh, disruptive uh, forces and I'll be focusing uh, a number of my remarks uh, tonight on the last four of these, in, uh, the areas of transportation, uh, health care, um, business operations and social uh, relationships. Let's begin with a uh, kind of uh, archetypal disruptor uh, in the area of uh, ride hailing uh, applications, Uber. Uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's important to, to notice the obvious and that is the old regime uh, involved certain routines. You, know, you called a taxi, you hailed a taxi, you went to a taxi rank, it also involves certain kinds of values, such as the assumption that a municipality has the right uh, to regulate uh, transportation in the public interest. And uh, these have been disrupted. And it's not only the routines that have been disrupted. We're now having to raise fundamental questions about some other values, about freedom of car owners to take passengers in their own cars about the inefficiency uh, of regulated markets and in turn the value of market uh, freedom, um, about the rights of consumers to choose uh, in the context of a market. We're, we're being drawn to talk about some fundamental, and I will call them intrinsic values, that we're not, and especially this is true I think at business schools, very capable of uh, sorting out, at least uh, with any, uh, any, any great clarity. We're talking about intrinsic values such as personal freedom, market freedom. They're notoriously difficult to operationalize and analyze uh, in business. <clears throat> Jim Walsh, uh, and some of you may know Jim. Uh, Jim uh, is a professor at the uh, University of Michigan and um, a, a remarkable, uh, remarkable scholar. I had the uh, pleasure of <clears throat> working with him recently and publishing a piece uh, in which we tried to get our arms around this notion of intrinsic value. Um, and the, the short story uh, that gets at the nub of the issue is that intrinsic values are in effect reasons uh, for acting. They're things that are worth acting for. Values, uh, no matter what uh, highly paid consultants want to say about them, in the end turn out to be reasons that explain our behavior. Um, as a simple kind of uh, test for your deepest values is to ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing. Give an explanation. So you might think of somebody uh, attending a management seminar, an executive, let's say. Why is she there? And she might say to herself, um, well, I'm here to acquire some, some tools, some, some pieces of knowledge. Uh, that will help me when I return to my job. And then the next question is, so what? So what? What will that do for you? And her next answer might be, uh, well, I, uh, I'll be able to more successfully complete my task 
and achieve what our firm uh, has as its objective. So what? What's that going to do for you? Well, uh, and of course the story can go in different directions. She might say, it will help me in the end to have more status, to get more money, so what? It will help me help my family. Or she might say, um, I'll be able to help the customer better and satisfy the customer's interests. And, and both of these stories might be true, but, but here's the point. Um, at the end, if you ask the so what question of either of those trails, the answer is, don't ask me that. That's a stupid question. Why do I want to help my family? That's a stupid question. I don't want to help my family for some other reason. I place intrinsic worth on the idea of family. I don't want to help the consumer and satisfy his or her interests for some other reason. I mean, perhaps there are other reasons, but that's enough, right? Satisfying the interests of other people, making a contribution, um, is sufficient to constitute a final reason for asking. And a final re reason for act acting is uh, an intrinsic value. Now, a non-intrinsic value is something along the road. And these are extremely important. Um, this is uh, derivative in the sense that it's derivative always from some more fundamental uh, reason for acting. Examples of non-intrinsic values, transaction cost reduction, higher market share, cycle time reduction, lower employee turnover, reduced strength. These are very important objectives. They may not be the end of the trail, and there are many reasons why business and business academe is populated heavily with non-intrinsic values. But we do need to contrast them with intrinsic values, which must lie at the end of the endeavor of business more broadly and at the end of our endeavors as, as human beings. Um, and I don't know what the end of the trail or the trails that you walk uh, happen to be, uh, but there's a form, uh, a shared form in humanity that you can see over the centuries, and they include things like integrity, fairness, uh, health, uh, happiness, the right to physical security, environmental uh, integrity. Um, now, one of, the, one of the challenges is that management theory tends to be dominated by non-intrinsic values, and probably for good reason. Uh, efficiency, for example, which isn't uh, a final reason for acting, but it helps us along the way, is extremely important, and you probably are aware um, that uh, theories of the firm, or maybe you're not, but, but if, you, if you get into these uh, discussions, two Nobel Prize winners, uh, Coase and Williamson, have uh, talked about the cost economizing effects, transaction cost reduction, as uh, kind of raison d'etre for the, for the firm. Um, and this is a piece of art, we're not going to go into it, but basically uh, the, the realm of business and business studies tends to be dominated by the left side of this map. You can map actually uh, contemporary management theories into non-intrinsic and intrinsic value trees. Um, but again, the, the, the challenge is if you work at the level of non-intrinsic values, um, it's very difficult to get an intrinsic value. Now, something like fairness, for example, is enormously important in business. You would be surprised. Loyalty of the employee to the firm is more strongly correlated with the employee's perception of the overall fairness of the process by which salaries are set than by the level of their own salary. Now, I'll repeat that. The, the loyalty that employee feels to the firm is more strongly conditioned by their perception of the fairness of the overall system, the sal by which salaries are generated, than how much they get. Uh, so these things are uh, extremely important, but they're extremely difficult. It turns out these are uh, extremely difficult to analyze and operationalize, uh, and it turns out it goes really deep. So even in the um, lower parts of the animal kingdom, I want to suggest there are four stages of value uh, disruption. Um, the first is the upending of existing rules, norms, routines, et cetera. The upending of what I've called in, uh, in uh, another context, micro-social contracts. The, the smaller kinds of uh, agreements that we have, some written down, some not written down, our, our sort of shared understanding 
uh, of uh, what's right and wrong and what should happen. Um, the second stage has to do with stakeholders, and I'm thinking here primarily uh, uh, employees, customers, and owners, but we also want to include the general public and, and probably also the government, questioning the intrinsic values that support the existing market relationships. Um, the third stage is when the stakeholders debate, and this is done in different uh, form, uh, the restructuring of the surrounding agglomeration of intrinsic values that relate to the disruption. Um, and finally, uh, when it reaches its, its fourth and final stage, there is a new set of micro-social contracts, a new set of agreements about the values, uh, including intrinsic values, uh, that need to, uh, need to prevail. Um, now, there's also something we might call a um, disruption accelerator. And this, uh, this aggravates some of the value disruption. So um, here are some standard uh, examples of disruptors. And the important thing to note is they all started off operating illegally. Uh, typically, they, they came to a point where their pockets were deep enough that they could fight things off. But uh, of 276 cities where it operated at the end of 2014, UberX was authorized by local ordinance in just 17. Now, let's illustrate these four stages using an old disruptor example, one that's reached its fourth stage, just so we can be clear about what's going on. And I'm, I'm using, uh, as my example of disruptor here, life-extending technologies. Um, the, this disruption has, has occurred in the last century. Um, and I'm thinking of fairly uh, simple kinds of things. Uh, so for example, uh, feeding tubes, respirators, kidney dialysis, antibiotics um, have absolutely disrupted that world in which life and death was defined easily enough uh, that we could relate to it in traditional ways. So some of those microsocial contracts had to do with never removing what's necessary to support the patient's life. There were obviously criminal penalties for homicide, still in existence, by the way. Patients and family members are assumed not to be able to impact the goals of medical treatment. And then what happens is people are hooked to machines and living on and on and on, but without being able to think or talk. Um, stakeholders begin to question. People have stake in this, this, the decisions that are being made. Uh, and the go-to value is always an intrinsic value. And in this case, it tended often to be the Hippocratic Oath. And the relevant part of the Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. That's a blunt instrument as an intrinsic value. And it doesn't help us very much sort out some of these challenges that are disrupting the situation. So we're we're moved to a point where we have to have the stakeholder debate. And this has been going on in the biomedical ethics literature, but it's been going on, as you know, in, in our, our ordinary walks of life for a long time. What's the definition of life? These are, these are big questions. What are the boundaries of patient autonomy, the right of a patient to choose their treatment, et cetera? Now, we aren't fully through the stage, but we're more or less uh, through it in the sense that we've, we've now created new microsocial contracts, and they include living wills, code designations for patient treatment, hospital ethics committees, rules for family interactions with death and dying decisions, et cetera. Um, we're never going to solve the problem, of course, but we, we now have a, a settled uh, four-stage uh, approach, and it came by way of uh, examination through, through intrinsic values. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an old example. Uh, let's now look at some newer examples. Uh, you are no doubt aware of the Cambridge Analytic uh, uh, Facebook uh, problem. Um, we have uh, the head of Facebook testifying in uh, the, the, uh, the Congress uh, and in the parliaments uh, of, uh, of Europe. And this disruption, uh, the disruption of uh, online uh, information processing uh, has forced us to rethink. We are, we are now in the early stages, and we don't know what the later stages of this uh, is going to, are going to look like. 
Um, but even if, uh, for example, Facebook decides to stop allowing um, algorithms to analyze information for educational purposes, that was sort of the loophole that Cambridge Analytica got in under, notice that the old processes, the old routines, the old sets of microsocial contracts are, are not going to work anymore. The, the old ones worked passably well when it came to things like privacy for medical records and then you would have to agree to this and that and so on. But notice what's happening today. These algorithms are being generated out of vast amounts of data in ways such that even their creators and users don't understand. There's a, there's a black box phenomena to this that makes it very difficult to, for me to check, yeah, it's okay for you to access and use my information or not. So a lot of the emphasis now is on values like the obligation, perhaps, of Facebook and others to package information that they can give to us about how our data is going to be used so that we can give a meaningful answer, yes or no. Uh, the dust has not settled on this, however, and we don't we do not know uh, how things uh, are going to turn out. Let's, let's look at another example. Um, and I'm going to ask all, just for some fun, I'll ask you a yes or no question here. Uh, should Damler's new self-driving car be programmed such that in traffic situation, in a traffic situation where the choice is between the life of the driver and the lives of two or more pedestrians, the lives of the pedestrians are favored? Now think for just a moment. <laughs> Should the car be designed such that it will favor the lives of the pedestrian over the driver? How many would say yes? See a show of hands. Okay, and how many would say no? Ah, um, so uh, let's, let's look. It, I, I may not have, 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 have phrased that in a way that uh, you could reasonably answer it, but, but let's, this, what, what's happening here is we're being forced in this situation to, to go beyond even some of the simpler levels of questions. We're being pushed back into some of the questions that get to the very heart of what counts as right and wrong, into disputes between deontological and consequential ways of thinking about things. Now, I don't know uh, how you would answer that, but uh, surveys have shown that in these trolley car uh, challenges, um, most people will favor saving the greater number of lives. However, there's a catch. If we change this, and it wasn't a robot making the decision, but it was you on the track, and there was a very heavy person, a fat person, that you could push on the track and that would stop the car losing the life of that person and saving four minors, it turns out we, make, we go in the other direction. Um, at any rate, I, I, I would suggest we're in a completely different world from the old world in which we were talking about driver negligence and contributory negligence on the passive, uh, on the parts of uh, uh, pedestrians and passerby. So, again, we're at a we're at a different level of uh, discussion. Uh, let's uh, let's ask uh, what, from my standpoint, is a pretty important question. Um, does the disruptive force, for example, a novel technology, tend to permanently frustrate the implementation of the intrinsic values that we hold? And let's, let's test this hypothesis against a couple of examples. Um, first of all, artificial intelligence and robotic decision making in the contrast of uh, operations and, and firms and social media, which we've already uh, touched on just a bit. Um, now, uh, one of the things that uh, research has shown is that uh, AI-dominated routines tend to create more psychic distance between the actual human beings and the other hu actually, actual human beings are, who are the leaders of the firm and the other human beings, customers or employees and so on, who uh, end up being recipients of those decisions. So it aggravates inattention to intrinsic values uh, such as fairness. And an example uh, of this is United Airlines. 
Now, I uh, was delayed in part because there was a drunk on a United Airlines plane in Philadelphia, and they're very careful, let me tell you, about how they, they we had a big burly security guard come on the plane and, and take this drunk off, and he was pretty awful. Um, it, it, it meant two and a half hours and uh, delayed my trip here, but, uh, but they're now very careful, and you probably know why. And the reason is they had a horrible instance in which um, a passenger was hauled off the plane, photographed by, uh, by cell phones. Uh, it turned out this person was a doctor. Uh, it turned out the decision had been made by AI, by an algorithm that took a variety of competing issues into account. Munoz, the CEO, for a few hours defended the algorithm, but only for a few hours, because it became obvious that, all, as all of us could see, something went wrong. That This passenger, by the way, was bumped so some other pilots could get on the plane. They had a, had a ticket already. Um, and indeed, uh, the human mind here could immediately fathom this issue. But the psychic distance that had been created by the application of, of the, the routine, the artificial intelligent routine, um, was incapable of working at that level of a hard case involving intrinsic values such as, as fairness and physical security and so on. Um, and a lot of this has to do with what uh, Jim Walsh and I have called the synoptic uh, character of intrinsic values. They tend, to, they tend to occur in clumps such the interpretation of one involves interpreting others uh, other values around them. So to, to make an interpretation about a hard call involving privacy, we have to make sure that the privacy protection doesn't end up um, aggravating the value of physical security to somebody else. We may actually need some information in some instances. So we can interpret one without all of them. This turns out to be extremely difficult from the standpoint of artificial intelligence. And I'm not saying it can never be solved. But in the foreseeable future, uh, it can't be. Another very interesting uh, consequence of AI, robotic decision making, is that it blocks what I call beneficent hypocrisy. Uh, and, and managerial decision making often involves uh, beneficent hypocrisy. Uh, these, now, in another example, not in business, but you see this in international relations a lot, justifications of foreign aid are almost always made on the basis of the self-interest uh, self of the donor country. Whether they actually benefit the donor company or the donor country or not uh, can, can be challenged. But they're almost never made uh, in the interests, the, the arguments are never made to the parliamentarians and so on, in the interests of the people who are going to benefit. Uh, and we have plenty of business examples of this. And, and by the way, I mean, people who are defending these things know better. But we have uh, similar kinds of examples of business. The explanations for pulling out of South Africa, if you ever survey uh, that history, were all made by alluding to the self-interests of the companies and not in terms of the values uh, of people who were being, uh, was having those values uh, violated by apartheid. Uh, corporate contributions to charity, and I love corporate contributions to charity, but um, there are assumptions made that simply don't wash as you look at uh, some of the data about their benefits to the company. Um, and often when layoffs uh, are, refrain, are, uh, are not undertaken, but the decision is to refrain from the layoff, uh, the explanation given is for the interest of the company. Now, I don't doubt that in, in many instances people believe this, but they never look into uh, trying to uh, justify it fully, because basically what's happening is a kind of beneficent uh, hypocrisy. Um, well, so this uh, disruption uh, impacts values, and in this interest of AI, instance of AI and robotics, as we can see, um, it tends to frustrate the implementation of intrinsic values. Let's look at another example. We've already touched on the social media uh, example. And as you recall, uh, that was somewhat uh, indecisive. It's in flux. It's very difficult to know whether, especially with, in the realm of the intrinsic value of privacy, uh, 
what's going to happen and whether that value can be successfully imp implemented given the disruptive uh, forces. But that's not the only example we could look at. We can look at one example where it's clearly positive from the standpoint of the implementation of intrinsic values, and that's the Me Too movement. So uh, Susan Fowler, who was a Penn uh, student at one point where, where I teach, uh, FT Person of the Year, and you probably know she in effect blew the whistle on Uber and was part of what started a movement that has, in my opinion, had a dramatically beneficial impact on the culture of uh, men and women in the workplace. So um, the old microsocial routines around sexual harassment cast everything into a he said, she said context. And I mean, I don't have to go over the, the difficulties there. Social media allowed for the first time for women using chat areas, blogs, uh, other, other digital uh, uh, online routines to work together and out a particular person. And the, the new truth is that it isn't just Harvey Weinstein uh, one against one anymore. It's Harvey Weinstein against a huge population of his victims um, and eventually the entire news consuming population. And, and by the way, even the legality here, which was so difficult to work out and is still being worked out, uh, doesn't always make a decisive difference, right? It, it, it turns out both, I don't know what it is in Australia, but certainly in the UK and the US, actually getting something through the courts and a remedy in the area of sexual harassment is incredibly difficult. And it is a he said, she said kind of thing. But if you look at the parade of men who have fallen and realize that you don't even need the courts to do that. If you have enough women who will testify that this guy is a complete idiot, he will lose his position. Uh, and it's happened again and again and again. Um, this is uh, what might be called the Weinstein effect. These are the different areas. And this, this, this was all enhanced by the use of uh, digital media. The, the disruption here had a very beneficial uh, effect. So let me summarize, let me conclude by noting the four stages of value uh, disruption. There's more to come. There's a lot more to come. It's going to, or it's going to force us to grapple more, as I have argued, at the level of intrinsic values. Um, in the broader scheme of history, this is not all bad. Um, it will force us in business schools to adjust some of our routines, our routines, and limited theoretical assumptions about the purpose of the firm. And this is some of what Thomas and the center are working on. And to that I say, it's about time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. It was very enlightening and entertaining at the same time as always. So uh, there were a few minutes for questions. If you want to ask the speaker any questions, feel free to do it now. I'm into the technology field, so you really inspired me. And you talked about issues that they bother me as well. Um, I will start from your last slide. Yeah. Why do we make the assumption that the disruption will end in a new equilibrium? meaning that we would settle down with new micro social contracts? Yes. I mean, this might not be the case, isn't it? Yes, yes. No, it's a, it's a wonderful question. My first question. Uh, definitely the sharing economy has disrupted a lot, yeah? Uh, but there is a lot of skepticism about this because what Uber and many other companies are doing is more or less replicating the existing economy with a new mask. Uh, so let's take the example of Uber, yeah? The drivers are being managed by an AI software, yeah? Yes. Uh, who will get the job depends on the percentage of uh, declines they have, of rides, uh, the time they accept it. So instead of a manager managing these micro-entrepreneurs, is a software, an algorithm, that defines who gets the ride, at what price, and whatever. 
Uh, so it's definitely capitalist, demand and supply, determining, uh, again, prices, rights, occupancy, whatever that is. So uh, many questions, yeah? Uh, why do we have to settle up with a new equilibrium? This yeah, might yeah. not be the case. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, well, right, great. And let me, yeah, no, and... Uh, Yes, yes. So, um, I mean, I think they're two separate questions, though. So, so the first question has to do with uh, whether we can expect an instance of, direct, uh, of disruption for the dust ever to settle. Um, might it be that the severity uh, of the intersection of the disruptive force and the existing microsocial routines is so severe that um, it not only will take a long time but never occur? Um, and I think it's an open question. I mean, I, I don't think our research at this point is, uh, is sufficiently accurate to, uh, to tell us. I would say this. I mean, in some ways, disruptions have been happening for millennia. And so you always get some new microsocial contracts uh, around, uh, say, the, uh, the institution of the, uh, now this is not a technological example, the institution of the nation state. I mean, this really threw the world off. Um, and uh, now we have migrants, uh, migrant families and populations, descendants of migrants uh, around the, Beng uh, the Bay of Bengal area. So we're talking uh, Malaysia, uh, we're talking um, uh, uh, Kuala, uh, we're talking um, Bangladesh. Yeah, Bangladesh, a number of these places where migrants moved, their families settled, Burma, their families settled before the nation state arose. The nation state arose and a lot of them were stuck there without the rights that they might have had had they started. So there are new microsocial routines for dealing with this in our country. We're having to deal with uh, so-called illegals. Um, and it's not a very satisfactory settling of the dust. And we hope it's temporary. We hope some more happens. But I guess my answer to this would be uh, there, there will be some dust settling, almost no matter what. But it may be that the intersection uh, represents such a severe clash that we never get the satisfaction of the, of the intrinsic values that we're looking for. Now, your other question is, aren't we just using old routines and our old prejudices and bias, bias, uh, biases in a new context? And I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the, uh, right now there's a genuine question about whether Uber, Uber drivers are independent contractors or employees. And that's the old way of framing the issue. Uh, what we actually need, at least from the standpoint of some of my colleagues at Wharton uh, that have been writing in this area, is uh, a quite a new set, not just of microsocial contracts, but also legal uh, mechanisms. And take, for example, also the question of the uh, Mercedes, the self-driving Mercedes. Now, I, I didn't tell you that the head of, he was a head of marketing, he was one of the top people at Mercedes, was asked this question, and to the media he said, uh, we will never, never design a car such that under certain circumstances it will kill the driver. Okay, that's a solution. Uh, now, I will say two weeks later, uh, this gentleman had a new position. And, and what Mercedes has said is, we haven't worked this all out, uh, which is probably right. But a lot of people think it's not Mercedes that needs to work it out. That's the old model. It's governments who need to set common standards that can be adhered to by, by, lot, uh, by, by all the automobile manufacturers. Uh, do we have time for uh, another one? Yes. I just wanted to ask in terms of the disruption, I'm assuming it's a bit of a cycle, like in terms of start at one, two, three, four, and then a new disruption starts. Are we becoming more adapted at, at, at getting to like stages two and three? Are, are we more used to, are the trends showing that we're more used to disruption and get to that quicker or no? Yeah. <laughs> That's, no, that's a great question. I mean, the, uh, the fast answer that a number of people will give is, at least in particular industries or areas, we're getting better because we've seen it happening before. Think of medical ethics. Uh, as new technology comes in, we at least now have an army of, uh, of people who are paid to think about such things. We know how to organize the hospital committees and so on to get uh, feedback and so on. The more pessimistic answer is that whatever we put in place is usually designed to handle the last disruption 
and doesn't do very well at the first. And this, of course, in financial services has been the model. We design Sarbanes-Oxley, or we design, uh, you know, in the wake of the financial crisis, these new, uh, you know, requirements for uh, creditworthiness and so on. The next, next uh, disruption is not going to look anything like that, and our, our measures may even aggravate right, what they do. So, uh, but anyway, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.